get started, mm. folks. Thanks for showing up. Good morning, and welcome to the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival. My name is Marnie Graff, and I'm your moderator for our exciting panel, Somewhere in Crime, Global Mysteries. I write the Nora Tierney English Mysteries, which move Nora around the United Kingdom, and also the Trudy Genova Manhattan Mysteries. I'm a member of Sisters in Crime, North Carolina Writers Network, and the International Association of Crime Writers. All of our panelists today have written at least one mystery series set somewhere other than the US. First of all, hats off to Kathleen Kelly and her talented crew. Thank, thank you, Kathleen, you know. and thanks to this lovely panel. And a quick housekeeping note for the audience, you have three jobs as you watch. First, have paper and pen handy to jot down the titles and authors of books we mention. Next, use the text box that you have for asking any questions that aren't covered and we'll get to those near the end of our time. And lastly, you must ignore any dogs, cats, or children who make a surprise <laughs> guest to get here. So since we have a truly rich panel, let's get to introducing them. First of all, please meet Wendy H. Jones. Give us a wave, Wendy. Coming to us all the way from Scotland. Wendy is an award-winning author who writes the D.I. Shona McKenzie series with six in this police procedural series. And the most recent is Killer's Crypt. At least I thought it was the most recent, but she was waving a new book cover. So she might have a new one on the way. We'll have her tell us about it. She's debuted a second adult series, The Cast Claymore Investigates Mysteries, titled Antiques and Alibis. Wendy also writes the Ferguson Flora YA Mysteries, The Birdie, The Buffalo Picture Books, and on the nonfiction side, the Writing Matter series for writers. This means she's got you covered for your reading needs from cradle to grave. <laughs> Wendy is also a writing and marketing coach, and she runs the Writing Matters online school and is the CEO of Authorpreneur Accelerator Academy. I quite like the sound of Authorpreneur, don't you? She's yes. president of the Scottish Association of Writers and hosts writing and marketing podcasts and is an international public speaker and likes to say she turned to a life of crime after 23 years as a nurse in both the Royal Army and the Navy. And she's actually still a major. So please say hello to Wendy H. Jones. Give us a wave, Wendy. Hello, everyone. All hello. right. Now we'll move back across the pond to Sarah E. Johnson, who lives and writes in North Carolina. Sarah spent a year exploring wondrous New Zealand and likes to say that everything she snooped, she found a mystery that needed writing. Sarah writes the Alexa Glock forensic mystery set in New Zealand. Molten Mud Murder was Sarah's debut. And the second, The Bones Remember, came out this September. Book three, The Bone Track, is slated for next year. Sarah lives in Durham, North Carolina, just three hours down the road from me, with her husband, Forrest, who spearheaded that famous year in New Zealand, and her golden doodle, Beaufort. She calls herself a part-time educator and full-time snooper and is the current president of Triangle Sisters in Crime chapter and also a member of the North Carolina Writers Network. So welcome, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. And now our author who is Scottish but lives in California since immigrating here in 2010. <laughs> Please say hello to Katrina McPherson. She's the multi-award winning and national best-selling author of the historical detective Dandy Gilver series set in 1930s Scotland with 15 in print. Uh, the two most recent are The Turning Tide and The Mirror Dance, as well as a strand of 11 contemporary psychological thrillers. The most recent was Strangers at the Gate. She's turned to life in California recently with three out in her humorous Last Ditch Motel series and the newest is titled Scott on the Rocks. Katrina is a proud lifetime member and former national president of Sisters in Crime. She lives on 20 scruffy acres, she calls it, in mm -hmm. rural Northern Cali on Patton Indian land with a black cat and a scientist. Note, she mentions the cat before the scientist. Welcome, <laughs> Katrina. Thank you. One of them might scratch so Let's get the right door. to our... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so let's get right to our topic, Sarah, since yours is geographically the furthest away. Let's start with New Zealand, which certainly isn't around the corner. Book one, Molten Mud Murder, was set on the North Island, while the second, The Bones Remember, is set on the South Island. Talk us through deciding to set your series there and how you keep up long distance in terms of setting. What do you use from your time living there to help refresh your memory? And has anyone ever pointed out where you've gotten it wrong? Oh. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, when my husband and I first arrived in New Zealand, the headlines were chance of finding the tourists alive very remote. There was a hu huge storm when we arrived and a young Canadian couple had rented a camper van and were driving across the jagged 
Southern Alps on the South Island and they disappeared. The chassis of their van was oh, found wow. a week later draped over a boulder in a gorge down below. The young woman's body washed down river and the man's femur was found three years later. And this just planted a seed in my mind that people can disappear in New Zealand. And when we visited the geothermal areas on the North Island, where my first book is set, I had just read an article about a little boy. In New Zealand, they are not near as picky about safety as we are. You can get right up close to things in New Zealand. In America, we'd have these big barricades. Um, anyway, this little boy just uh, slipped away from his family and was boiled in a sulfuric pool. And when I saw a mud pit for the first time, I just turned around to my husband and I said, I've got to kill somebody here. So in my first book, I did. <laughs> and about six months into our stay in New Zealand, my husband said, do you want to go shark cage diving? And I'm like, what? And we were planning our visit to Stewart Island, which dangles off the South Island. Uh, and apparently is not apparently is a mecca for great white sharks. They migrate there starting every December. And that's where, uh, that's when this book uh, starts out December when the sharks arrive. And I'm like, well, no, I don't really think I want to go shark cage diving. So could I just see the panelists? Would you go shark cage diving? Raise your hand if you would. No. <laughs> oh, I would not. Okay. Anyway, I wasn't really afraid to go shark cage diving, but I really just thought we should leave the sharks to in peace. But little did I know the shark cage diving industry on the island, which only has 400 people, is just, it's riven the island. It has split the island between people who want it and people who don't want it. And the locals say the industry is making the sharks more aggressive, that they coexisted with these sharks uh -huh. for centuries. And now they're dangling tourists and they're dangling chum over the side of the boats. They're attracting the sharks and sharks are showing up where people hadn't seen them before. So that's the tension that is explored in my second book. Um, but anyway, I thought- And people... I've got some- Sorry, Marnie. Go ahead. I'm just going to say, uh, people no, go ahead. in New Zealand, but uh, why not make it uh, not a terrible accident, but make it murder? So that's why I set the series. And plus, I think people are curious about New Zealand. And yes, and I, I have a lot of comments coming in, and I would say nine out of 10 of them um, would not go shark diving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you could see that at all. Yeah, that's right. fine. No way. Not a chance. <laughs> No. Katrina, I traveled to the UK every two years for setting research before COVID cut my wings. I moved Nora around different parts of the UK as you moved Dandy and her partner Alec around their private investigative work. But you set the series in the 1930s. So while you're a Scottish native, you also live across an ocean and have the added burden of not having lived in that time period. How often do you get back? And how did your setting research change during lockdown? With your newest The Mirror Dance set in Wendy's Dundee, have you made any blunders that Wendy would pick up on? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, so in the before times and, you know, please God in the after times, which are coming, I'm there every summer. Um, uh, and the time period is not too onerous because, I mean, Wendy will probably uh, corroborate this. If you want to see what a bit of Scotland looked like in, looked like in the 20s, you just go and look because nothing's, nothing's changed. The buildings are made of stone and they just last and last and last. One of the weird things about moving here was people tearing down buildings all the time, like people buying a house and flattening it and building a new one. I was astonished by this. Um, so what yeah. I did... I managed to research the, I'm going to hold it up because this is the book that ha some people want the book, but most people want the coat. Oh, this is the mirror dance beautiful. that's set in Dundee. Um, it's, a, it's an upgrade from this coat. Look at that. In the turning tide. <laughs> so maybe this book will do well because people aren't concentrating on the coat. Um, I had researched Dundee. I'd been in Dundee, beautiful city, tramping around to research the mirror dance and then the next one that I've written is set in Edinburgh which is where I'm from so I could I could get there with Google's oh. wee orange man uh, without too much trouble Excellent. 
But it, the mistakes, I'm just going to put this out there right now. Wendy, just brace yourself. I had someone, well, Dandy and Alec, drive over the Tay Bridge in 1937. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Tay Road Bridge was built in the 60s. Yeah. The oh, Tay Bridge that was rebuilt in 1895 was a rail bridge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it hurts. <laughs> But you know, d- d- back me up, Wendy, if you if you want to. But doesn't the Tay Road Bridge look quite Art Deco? It does. It doesn't. Thank it you. looks like it should be older than it really is. Thank you. It does. I mean, it doesn't look like sixties architecture. I never thought of it. I drove over and back and over and back. You know, so, sort of concentrating and also looking around. And and <sighs> now, nah, well, never mind. Not to I worry. Know. It's let lots of people. <laughs> Not men. Men tell me <laughs> <laughs> all right Wendy you're up and you have an advantage in that you live in Dundee where both the D.I. Shona McKenzie and the Cast Claymore series are set now I use my acknowledgments page to let readers in on what's real and what's fictional how do you handle blending fact and fiction and have you ever been called in on the change that you've made well on the whole, my books are straight out of my head. They really are. So, but you get a lot with Dundee. I have to explain that Dundee. I'll just put the Dundee tourist trade. I'll just go down now. Um, Dundee is the murder capital of Scotland. So, and it really is in real life. It's the murder capital of Scotland. <laughs> so, we, although we're tiny and we don't actually have that many murders, we have more murders per capita than anywhere else in Scotland. So we are the so really and truly, you don't need a lot of imagination to kill somebody in Dundee. So it's perfect for killing folk, really. And as Katrina says, a lot of things don't change. And I remember yeah. things, what they were like in the 60s. I was born in the 60s. I remember them. Um, I remember what, I know what they're like now. And I remember all the murders that have happened throughout the whole time. Mm. So, you know, you say to the police, um, what, you know, what can I do? Where can I dump a body? And they just go, whatever you like, somebody will already have done it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so really and truly, it doesn't matter where you dump a body, somebody will go, oh, did you base that on such and such a murder and you go no it was out of my head (laughs) you know I didn't base it on anything that Um, is astonishing because if people if you said guess which Scottish city is the murder capital in a rousing chorus everyone would say Glasgow Glasgow. and I say that as someone from Edinburgh sorry but it's true that's amazing Dundee is the murder capital of Scotland. So I do take some liberties because I spoke to the police and I, they came and they spent like five hours in my house drinking tea and eating biscuits, as you do, and told me all about policing in Scotland. And then they said, oh, but don't write about what we do. He said, they said, for example, at the end of my books, if there's a police chase with guns, my police team turn into the specialist team because the Scottish police are not armed. If they need mm. teams with guns, they have to get in a specialist team, an mm-hmm. armed response team. Well, I can't do that because if you inter- introduce 20 new characters in the last two chapters, people get really upset. And if your main character doesn't catch the bad guy or girl, people get really upset. So I do take some liberties and I do get people saying to me, oh, Wendy, you do know that the Scottish police aren't armed. And I just very politely say, yes, I do realise that. But <laughs> for the sake of, you know, artistic uh, licence, okay. I just do mm-hmm. it. There you so, go. There you but yeah, go. I do play fast and loose in right. some ways. On the whole, I stick to it. Okay. I think most readers are pretty aware that there's, you know, we're creating a fictional world and we're going to take some liberties. So I agree with you totally mm-hmm. on that. Now, I found out early on in writing the Nori Tierney said there were a lot of slang terms that I used that were outdated because, you know, being American, they were gleaned from Masterpiece Mystery and Agatha Christie. So I have friends in the UK who are available to me and they answer questions as they write and they act as beta readers. So they correct what I call my Brit speak and anything else that I get wrong. But Nora is an American living. So let's talk mm-hmm. about these differences, cultural and language. Katrina, your last Ditch Motel series her, the protagonist is Lexi Campbell, and she's from Dundee. And yes, with her does. figuring out American slang while her friends take apart her Scottish phrases, that sort of adds to the fun. How much of Lexi is based on your move from Scotland to the U.S.? 
Oh, absolutely. And sorry, Wendy, about Dundee. I honestly, I sat and thought, what place in Scotland is least like California? And came up with Dundee. <laughs> You'd be about right, because you know. I don't think you get as much rain as you do. No, you oh, would be I looking at Dundee a while it. before you thought of California, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. safe to say, but it's all said with love. Um, oh, she's absolutely, she's absolutely based on me. And I started writing it after 60, uh, 16, six years here. But I gave her all the clueless things that I did my first <laughs> year or two here. Um, so, for, uh, oh, but one of them was my sister when she was here. So the word rubber in British English means eraser, which everyone knows, uh, which people who've been caught that way know. And my sister, Audrey, God love her, uh, shouted out across a giant thrift store, Hey, Katrina, do you think it's disgusting to buy second-hand rubbers? <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Which is the absolute epitome of language breakdown. <laughs> so yeah. things like that, yeah, I give to I give those mistakes to... We're getting and, and a more, chorus more of left out loud and no nos from the, from the crew <laughs> watching for that. that wow, was, that was that's right. Bad. Just, so, yeah, just give her all my mistakes. The... Oh, my gosh. My okay. real friends so, are Sarah, much kinder to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Sarah, I imagine North Carolina barbecue is vastly different from New Zealand barbecue. Yeah, I don't Alexa think we Alexa Glock ate. is an American. <laughs> right, right. Alexa Glock is an American from North Carolina, and she's getting used to very different country and way of life and learning its customs. So as she learns about New England culture, so do we, your readers, which to me is a very interesting part of the book. Mm -hmm. The differences in flora and fauna, the Maury tattoos, what experts helped you accomplish that research into another culture? Now you're back here. And did you find forensic techniques different between the U.S. and New Zealand? Wow. Um, I've had so much help uh, with, I've had a Maori expert uh, read it for uh, sensitivity and just mm -hmm. to make sure that I understood the beliefs. I have a wonderful, wonderful uh, forensic expert here in Durham, North Carolina, who is reading all my work now to make sure I get my forensics right. And uh, maybe later on, I'll be able to tell you a few of my forensic bloopers. I had a shark expert in this book. I don't, don't you think sharks are solo predators? Don't you think they hunt alone? Well, I just did so much shark ex, uh, reading, but they don't. In New Zealand, my shark expert saw 11 sharks, 11 great white sharks in one area off, off of Stewart Island at one time. So no, they don't just hunt alone. They hunt in packs. And that's, is that not terrifying? Uh, I've had rangers help me. I've had um, a Pakeha or Caucasian Kiwis read my work. Um, I use lots of different experts to help me get it right. And, and they've been invaluable. Wow. Do, do you pay your experts, someone wants to know? I, I do not pay experts. my do experts. Have to give them um, no, no, um, I've not, not paid anyone. I did thank the people that helped me in Stewart Island by, I think there are four of uh, the Bones Remember on Stewart Island. <laughs> And it cost me $60 to send four books to Stewart Island, New Zealand. Woo, that was expensive. Yeah. But anyway, um, no, yeah, I, I acknowledge my experts, of course, and the acknowledgments. And uh, they just, I think Margaret Marin taught me that. She said you know, she was never a judge and all her books were, uh, her main character was a judge. She said, experts are just so happy to talk to you. Just ask them. And that's, that's what I that's found is they're very willing to help and kind of tickled to do yes, so. Yes, they all. Yeah, they want you to get it right, right? So, Wendy, that fish out of water thing applies to Shona McKenzie. Although she was born in Dundee, she was raised in England and has moved back. And she frequently points out the differences between England and Scotland. Yet you've taken a leap in a totally different direction with past Claymore because she's Dundee born and bred. And you've thrown her into a profession as a private investigator when she has no real direction on guidance on how to be one. In contrast to Shona, who's very accomplished as a detective inspector, what made you choose that direction? Well, I I love um, I love uh, why me Stephanie Plum books, and Stephanie Plum 
is just hapless. And I thought, oh, I'm sure there's room for a, a Scottish Stephanie Plum. So really and truly, I wrote my Cass Claymore books. She's, she's a, a redheaded motorbike riding ex-ballerina who inherits a private detective agency and she has absolutely no clue what she's doing. She's, she's injured. She can't be a ballerina anymore. She needs a job and her husband very, uh, and her husband, her, and she not her husband, her uncle um, very conveniently shuffles off this mortal coil and she gets left this detective agency because she'd been doing a bit of filing for him to pass the time. Anyway, she also inherits this God awful dog that just is a nightmare, but she has to keep the dog if she wants to keep the detective agency. So then suddenly she's landed with an ex con dwarf as an assistant. She ends up taking him on and her granddad. And the whole thing's just a shambles. It's, it's, and it all came completely out of my brain. And it all started because I love Stephanie Plum. Well, I thought, well, maybe nobody will pick this up. All the Americans, when they do the reviews, they're going, oh my goodness, this is a Scottish Stephanie Plum. <laughs> um, just, just, See, you got to be spot on. Sorry? It's the very humor. Yeah, it's very, very humorous. It's just crazy. The other one is very police humorous. procedural, and that just came out of my head. I like police procedurals. I was at a loss, and I always wanted to write a book, and I thought, oh, well, I came up with this idea. And she was born, um, Detective Inspector Shona McKenzie. But she does have a – there's some humor in that as well, because she has a cast of misfits, really, that work for her, even though they're, they're professionals. You know, two of them are always at each other's throats because they're young and they young <laughs> Lock dogs, so they're like button stags, you know. She's got a, a detective who's near to retirement, and he's the one that actually knows everything because he's been in Dundee for so long. And she's got, um, you know, another couple of young, uh, newly promoted sergeants. So she's got a team that are not really gelling when she first starts out, although by se book seven, they are gelling. And can I just say, when in terms of um, being a fish out of water, She's going to, in book seven, Killer's Curse, which isn't quite out yet, but will be out in April, um, she's actually in Dundee and New Orleans. And oh. Katrina will tell you, oh. I met her in New Orleans for the first time. And out of my visit to that city, because I was speaking at VoucherCon, this book has been born. So she's going to America. She'll really be like a fish out of water. Oh, there. good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can't wait to see that. Well, listen, before we run out of time, I'd like to have each of us recommend an author to our viewers whom you think they might not know, but whose books you enjoy. And I'll go first. My pick is Nicola Upson, who writes the Josephine Tay series set between the world wars. Tay was a pseudonym of Elizabeth McIntosh, and she used that name for her crime novels. And Upson treats the fictional Tay as the protagonist in a series of mysteries that have very intricate relationships between the characters, accurate period details, and a cracking good mystery. And she often has surprise mystery guests. One book has Alfred Hitchcock. Um, the most recent is this one. It's called The Dead of Winter. And uh, in the US, it's titled The Secrets of Winter. It's set in Cornwall at St. Michael's Mount at Christmas time. And here, Marlena Dietrich is a guest, along with Tay, her partner, and the detective, who's their friend. Hmm. An expert in murder starts that series, and I highly recommend it. Katrina, who did you choose? Oh, I'm going to say I'm going to buy that uh, Nicola Ups in the Dead of Winter and start my Christmas reading pile because <laughs> Cornwall, Christmas, and Josephine Tay sounds fantastic. Ah, I, I second that. Um, I now, there's nothing worse, you know, when someone's recommending writers, there is nothing worse than someone saying, and she's written 43 books. So I'm going to recommend someone who's just published his debut, which makes it very easy because there's only one. And that's a writer called David Heska Wandley Wyden whose debut novel, Win Winter Counts, I thought was perfect for this panel because it's set in one sense here, but it's set in the Lakota nation on a reservation um, in South Dakota about, and it's Virgil, oh, I've forgotten his second name. Anyway, Virgil, who's a, an enforcer. He's a muscle man for the, uh, for the Lakota. Uh, who who falls into terrible trouble but it's mm -hmm. just wonderful it's a beautiful book and it's shortlisted for an edgar so wow. you know it's not just wow. me thinks that but um it's and a I beautiful book and it's fascinating award. You what, what's his last name again Katrina? well i think Tell us Wyden, his last name again. w e i d n and david is his first okay. name and i think from the bit of um lakota language in the book i think heska wandley is a Lakota name but it's it's okay. just 
Can't wonderful. Wait. And it's a thriller plot and it moves along and there's a puzzle, but it's also, you know, an exploration of a, a, a place that kind of exists in the same physical space as America, but it's completely different. Mm. Mm. Okay, that sounds great. Sarah, who did you choose? Hi, and I already see it in the chat, but I chose Ellie Griffiths just because I love her Dr. Ruth Galloway. She oh, is a, uh, a forensic anthropologist and her settings are windswept beaches in uh, remote windswept beaches in Northern England. And I'm just in love with her cat Flint and her daughter Kate and uh, Harry Nelson, the on and off love affair. And I just think they're wonderful books. Oh, excellent, excellent. How about you, Wendy? Well, I have to say, this is the toughest question to answer because you immediately <laughs> think, I'm literally going to upset every one of my writer <laughs> friends by not mentioning them. So I will have no friends left at the end of this, but hey, I can it. I've been on, in the house on my own for a year anyway, so, you know, I'll deal with it. Um, I'm going to say David Wishart. Now, David Wishart is a Scottish author. He lives near me. He lives in Angus. Um, he writes Roman mysteries. They're, they're actually set in ancient Rome, and they're the most fantastic mysteries I've ever read. But the best bit of it is he has them all using modern language. He literally did not want to use any old language, so they all say things like, hi, pal, how are you doing, and things like that. <laughs> But the blending of that is so brilliant. It's funny. And it just really, really um, appeals to me. And his, his, his research is outstanding. He, I, you, I cannot tell you how much research he does for these books. Mm -hmm. And yet you wouldn't know that you're actually having a history lesson reading these books because they're just such good uh, Roman mysteries. So I'm going to go with David Wishart. Oh, excellent. That sounds really good. All right, so here's something now I want to ask you about. Let's talk about what drew you to a life of crime, so to speak. I was fortunate to have had a relationship with P.D. James for the last 15 years of her life. Wow. I considered her my friend. Yes, absolutely amazing. But I, but I knew as a teen that I wanted to write. I was a nurse like Wendy for 30 years. When did you know you had stories you just had to write? Um, and who were your mentors if you had them? And if you were young, were you encouraged by teachers or parents? Um, Sarah, tell us what your journey was. You know, one of um, my mentors, I think, was Margaret Marin, who recently died. And I started reading her uh, Deborah Knott, Judge Deborah Knott mysteries, uh, probably in my, I don't know, 30s, and followed her throughout her 20 books and was able to meet Margaret and Margaret knew my editor, and I think, I think, she says she didn't, but I think she helped me get a contract from one book to three books, so she's somebody that I've always admired, and uh, I think, she, I, I think of her as my role model for becoming a writer, and unlike you women, um, you know, I'm only, my third book is coming out next February, my first book was published when I was 60, so I say it's never too late, I just want to pass that on to everyone. It's never too late to start your writing career. I, can I Absolutely. just say, I'm Absolutely. sure I'm not the only one now thinking, what do you use on your face, Sarah, right? What do you mean when I was 60? <laughs> wow. Like well, thank you. <laughs> well, Katrina, since you spoke up, go ahead, tell us, maybe you could answer that question too. Um, yeah, I mean, my mentors were, I met Phyllis at uh, P.D. James once uh, when she was still with us, but uh, you know, at a big, at a big event at, at Harrogate, Wendy, don't uh, you know, at the oh, yeah. Festival, um, yeah. Festival at Harrogate. Uh, but my mentors were just from the library. My mentors were the Golden Age writers. Mm -hmm. So Josephine Tay, yeah. Agatha Christie, of yeah. course, Curtsy, uh, Marjorie Allingham and uh, Niall Marsh. Um, they weren't in my life in my life were people saying, oh, don't be so daft, you know, who, I mean, we didn't know writers. I didn't, I'd never met a writer. I didn't know that was something that a wee girl from a place like where I come from could do. Mm. Um, and my, I got into crime because my first book that I wrote um, when I had just left being a university lecturer, they'd call it a professor here, but lecturer, um, uh, was just, awful and I put it in a drawer and it was never going to go anywhere and so I wrote 
a love letter to the golden age to cheer myself up. Oh. And that was the first that was the first Dandy oh. Gilver novel just because they were what I oh, and it was it was the scientist not the cat cats are useless for this it was the scientist who said <laughs> well just just what do you love what do you love just write something that mm -hmm. you want to write and mm -hmm. straighten yes. your face out properly yes. so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah how about you mm -hmm. Wendy you had well, mentors and what turned you to a life of crime well I've always been had a life of crime I was an early reader and I, by the time I was five I was reading you know uh Nancy Drew and the famous five and secret mm -hmm. seven and and my mother when I was seven bought me a typewriter not because she thought I was ever going to be a writer but because she wanted me to be a secretary and she thought she better start me off early but she failed miserably in the terms of, uh, <laughs> of becoming a secretary but she did set me on my life of a writer because I started writing naughty fan fiction when I was seven you know so I've always oh, written my goodness. But then I joined the military and I was all over the world. But the first thing I always did when I went anywhere in the world was join the library and I borrowed books and I read every mystery book known to man. So all the crime writers, every crime writer known to man was my mentor, but the Scottish crime writers mm -hmm. in um, particular, because and they what they are in a lot of ways because you meet them you you hear uh, a lot from them you learn from them um, and I also read all the books so wherever I was in the world I always had a bit of Scotland but the problem is that our biggest our biggest exports whiskey our second biggest export is crime fiction so the rest of the world <laughs> thinks we're a bunch of murderers so really and truly I had to live up to that so you know. That's why I turned to a life of crime. There you crime. go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us your, your, who are some of your favorite Scottish crime writers. Oh, now there again, you upset everybody if you don't mention them all. You know what I mean? But the ones that I like, I love Alex, I know, just Gray, Alex Gray, Lynn Anderson, Val McDermott, obviously, Ian Rankin, um, who else? Uh, S.G. McLean, who's a historical writer. Um, blimey, I'm trying to think because I read so many of them. There are just so yeah. many. And of course, Katrina, even though she lives in California, I count her as a Scottish crime writer. And Katrina's amazing. Um, you know, and there are, there are other ones as well that I like that are not in in Britain, but not in Scotland, but they do write humorous crime. People like Simon Brett. Simon Brett's books are just the biz. I love them. We, you know, uh, and we had him speaking at the Scottish Association of Writers Conference, and he's amazing, amazing man, funniest man on the planet. Um, and yes, he's very so there are so many good Scottish crime writers that you just can't, um, wow. you know, choose because yeah, it's hard to narrow it down. all of them. And mm. if I haven't mentioned you, I'm sorry, I love you anyway. <laughs> All right, Sarah. So, you know, your secondary characters are a mix of New Zealanders from that brooding detective Alexa has to work with to the Maury Sargent she's often paired with. Do you see those relationships lasting? Uh, you know, another thing about Margaret Marin is uh, her in her books, um, Deborah and I can't remember his name got married like in book seven. And I think oh, the show? Uh, that. Yeah, I think that um, I think that Bruce will end up Bruce and Alexa will end up together. But Margaret Marin said, you know, be open to something different. And so I like to think that uh, there's another character that will show up in a future book. So I don't know how you all okay. handle romances in your books, but um, I'm open to somebody else sweeping Alexa off her kids. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we'll have to keep yeah. keep an eye on that part. Katrina, yes. um, in the Last Ditch series, Lexi Campbell has her own set of compatriots who are very unusual. Tell us who Lexi spends her days with. Oh, yeah. So she, she lives at this, the Last Ditch Motel, uh, which is named after the Last Ditch Slough. I didn't know. I, I said Slough. Uh, <laughs> Slough Canal that runs along the back. Um, and she... When I started writing about a motel, the idea was that everybody would just be staying there for two or three nights. And so there would be a different cast of characters every time. And I would get to write about these transients and they have got no discipline. And I absolutely fell in love with them all in mm -hmm. book one and had to change everything so that they lived, so that two of them became the owners of the motel. So there's a couple that own the motel and one of whom is very straightforward, very down to earth. Um, and the other one is a massive germaphobe. Um, so she runs the cleanest hotel 
in all of California, <laughs> motel rather, uh, Kathy, and she gets insecticide that's illegal. It, it's, it's illegal in California. It's so good it's even illegal in Nevada. She gets it from her cousin in Costa Rica. Um, and another couple who live there are doctors. And you think, well, why would doctors live in a motel? Because one of them is uh, has kleptoparasitosis, uh, which means a fear of insects, a fear of imaginary oh. insects in the environment. So the only place he's happy is in this hotel that's that's got Costa Rican insecticide um, all over it. So they live there permanently too. And there's another, a single mother and her adorable little boy who live there for the more normal reason that people live permanently in motels which is they don't have enough money to live anywhere else mm -hmm. so this is her little scooby gang of people who were only meant to be in book one and now they're i've just written them into book four and i don't care it's like wendy <laughs> oh, says who's gonna happy. stop us it's the best thing about this job how can anyone stop us <laughs> No, oh, no, and good. they're wonderful. <laughs> they're a wonderful support for her. Um, Sarah, you said you had a forensic story you wanted to share. Oh, uh, well, um, like I'm using this wonderful expert. And so you had asked us, uh, you know, what were some of the bloopers you had? And this isn't forensics, yes. but I think one of my biggest bloopers is my main character's name, Alexa. Because when people listen to my books, their devices go off. And there's nothing I can do about that now. I can't change Alexa's name. So, but anyway, my forensic bloopers. So Alexa was oh. taking some a cadaver's fingerprints, but the cadaver was in full rigor mortis. And I had done a lot of, you know, I tried to do very careful research. And I had Alexa dip the person's hand in a teacup of hot water. And I had read that that, uh, reduces rigor mortis so she could then roll the person's fingerprints. Well, this is what my forensic expert said. And she is such a geek. She said, hand boiling is not used to break rigor. It's used to plump the ridges back up and make them recordable when a, when a body has been waterlogged. And she told me how to break rigor. And there's two ways to break rigor. And one is to slash the wrists and I wasn't going to do that because that was too bloody. And the other is you just snap and you have to use all your strength to break rigor. And it really does make a horrible, horrible noise. And then, so that's what I have oh, Alexa doing. And then I found out that you still can't roll. It's still very hard to roll. Even when rigor is broken, it's hard yeah, to yeah. roll the fingerprint. So my wonderful forensic expert introduced me to what they call the deceased spoon or the corpse spoon. And so now Alexa has a corpse spoon in her traveling forensics uh, kit. So anyway, it's wonderful I it. having I love it. a forensic expert who catches my mistakes before they get published. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Um, Katrina, do you have an expert for the historical details or you do that research yourself on Google and the like? Oh, Katrina, we lost your volume. I know. I muted myself because I was laughing. Sorry. Um, I love, okay. do you know, did anyone else think of breaking rigor? I'm thinking of that nightclub jewelry. You know, you get those long things and you have to crack them and then the lights come on and you can dance all night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so for one book, which was set in the village where I was born, and my father was also born in that village, it made it really hard to do underage drinking because I was the fourth daughter of Jimmy McPherson, who everyone knew. Um, and so for that book, my research process was arm in arm with my dad. I just walked around and he told me who lived in that house and what was there and, you know, how this worked and told stories. So that was... That was the most access I've ever had to an expert. And it was just fantastic. Oh God, I love it. I love it. But usually, I used to work for two years. I worked in a local studies department of the Central Library in Edinburgh. So I know what they've got. And so, and I, I kind of know where it is. And that's what I use. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. I just want to say that Art Taylor let us know that his Alexa triggered as we were talking. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, how about some questions from our audience now? We've got a few more minutes left with the panelists and I'm looking at the chat box and I'm hoping that we're going to get some reasonable questions coming up here. Nothing salacious. Somebody wants, somebody early on and I can't find it now, wanted to know if you've ever had a drink. Let me see if I can find it at a certain pub. 
Oh, they wanted to know if Katrina had ever had a drink with Ian Rankin. Uh, no. Oh, with Ian, that's it. Okay. In the Cumberland bar. No, but my brother-in-law, um, I'm one of four sisters and my husband's one of four brothers. And one of these brothers lives in Edinburgh and quite often is propping up the other end of the bar with Ian mm. in the Cumberland. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. Um, here's a question. It's, it's, it's like How do you Wendy research said, a place? It's such a small you... country. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's such a small place. Okay. Yeah. Scotland. Okay. So here's a question. How do you research a place you want to base a story on but can't afford to travel to? Who wants to take that one? Well, I... Sarah, you know, take that one. Because the internet is a wonderful place. You know, I have been to New Zealand, mm -hmm. but it was 2013 and 2014. And so, you know, I have to do so much research now. So I would suggest finding experts, asking experts finding somebody that lives there and talk to the people that live there, read books. Blogs have been a huge help to me, writing, uh, reading blogs of people, um, maps, you know, Google Maps. Uh, I used a map of uh, uh, Stewart Island that was a great help. So, you know, really the world's at your fingertips. Yes, yes. All right. So here's another question. Do you think there's a difference in approach between male and female crime writers? Hmm. Katrina, you want to take that one? Take that. Yeah, I think there's I think there's more crossover than, you know, if it was a Venn diagram, there would be a big mixed mm -hmm. circle in the middle and then little crescent moves yeah. on either side. I mean, certainly uh, very, um, very procedural, very forensic, um, very bloody novels probably have more men writing them than women, but then there's there's Sarah <laughs> and Val McDermott and people like that. And certainly in the at the cozy end of the uh the sort of jump and drop your knitting spectrum, mm -hmm. there are more women writing than men, but then there's Simon Brett who um mm. who's squarely in that circle. Yeah. So yeah. I think they're you know it's like yeah. height. I think mm -hmm. the shortest women shorter than the shortest man and the tallest man's taller than the tallest woman but there's a massive over overlap yeah. okay yeah. Uh, somebody would like to know how we can encourage the publication of more mysteries set outside the british isles or the u.s in different places like sarah has wendy you've traveled extensively in the service do you have any suggestions about that well I think there are more than we realize. We just don't come across them. So I think mm -hmm. the answer is how do we find them and how do mm -hmm. they become more available? For example, I went to um, Cambodia for three and a half weeks to um, do some work. And I, it was, I wasn't a writer at that point. I went to do some work uh, for a company. And I, at the airport on the way back, I discovered there's an absolute slew of Cambodian crime writers. And I bought a load of Cambodian crime books at the airport. Now, I would never have known that if I mm -hmm. hadn't have gone to that. So I think it's trying to research who is out there already, mm -hmm. because there are more than we think. And I think mm -hmm. the problem is that we've got the emphasis on UK and US crime writers and we forget there's a whole wide world mm -hmm. out there. So whenever I go abroad, yeah. I always, always, always try to find the local authors mm -hmm. and I will read their books and yeah. read books set in that area because you will get more from a novel than you will from reading mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a tourist book mm -hmm. because the novel will tell you what it's really yeah. like. You Can know? I piggyback Absolutely. on that? I really love the risk, uh, Mystery Readers Journal. Oh Are you guys familiar with that? And it will um, it will say Mystery Readers of Scot or Mystery Novels of Scotland, Mystery Novels of Italy, Mystery Novels of um, um, Botswana, and uh, they're mm -hmm. just a great resource for finding mysteries mm -hmm. set in different locations. It's a really fun journal to read. Excellent. I think it's excellent, changing excellent. slowly. I mean, far too slowly. It is changing. So there are there are more people working in New York publishing and London publishing to talk about traditional publishing for a moment who are who are beginning to see that we can, you know, we we maybe more Indian writers, Pakistani writers, writers from Bangladesh, writers from uh, all the countries in the African continent. Um, it, it, it's changing slowly. I hope it's not just a moment this time. Mm -hmm. I hope it's a permanent change. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a permanent change. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Katrina, do you think historical settings help or hinder the crime story? Oh, help, help, help. Always help. Because there's no forensics. Like, you don't help. have to know stuff that it's really hard to find out and there's no mobile phones. That's also a really good reason to set books in Galloway, even in the current day, because the reception is appalling. And it's, every, I mean, <laughs> it's really difficult to get someone yeah. into extreme yeah. peril now because yes. everyone can film what's happening or they can call for help. Yes, so, in New Zealand you know, too, Katrina. Yes, oh yeah, right, things. yes, exactly. Yes. So any remote areas, uh -huh. uh, but yes, it's it's much easier. And also because it never happened. I mean, private detectives never solved murders, but because they did it in the golden age yeah. books that we love, mm -hmm. we can believe it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's bonkers, yeah. but it doesn't bother us so much <laughs> as it does in present day. No, yeah. no. Readers are very happy to put reality aside because they, they love that fictional world, right? I mean, that's right. the whole reason we're in there. So, so here's, a, here's a general question from Audrey. How do you discipline yourself to finish a book after it stalls? Anybody have that experience? Mm. Typing and weeping. Yes, typing Katrina weeping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typing and typing weeping. And weeping. Mm -hmm. never give okay. up just even if you're crying mm -hmm. you're going this is garbage I'm going to have to get a proper job mm -hmm. again just mm -hmm. keep going mm -hmm. just, I, I totally just stick agree. with it one foot in front of the other mm. okay. okay all right one how about another, your book's written one, one finger right. press after another yeah. your book gets written just keep your fingers moving yeah. Also, I would say, like, really quickly, if you promise yourself you're not going to show anyone the first draft, it doesn't matter how bad it is. Mm -hmm. So if you're not giving the pages to anyone, you mm -hmm. can't embarrass yourself. <laughs> so I would say just never show anyone the first draft. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, um, I think that's one thing that I always impress on my writing students, that your first draft is for you. And it's never, ever going mm -hmm. to be what's published. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a lump of clay and you take that yeah. and you yeah. scrape it and you mold it and you sculpt it into yeah. something beautiful. And one mm -hmm. thing I learned from P.D. James is that she said to me, you absolutely positively have to understand that the real writing gets done in revision. That's yeah. where the real writing yeah. gets done. The yeah. first step is to get your story out there. And, um, and after that, all the, then you make it pretty, you know, mm -hmm. um, we've just got a minute or two left. That's right. So let's see. Um, any inspirations from your novel? Did anybody get inspired by writing their novel? Mm, that's a I tough one. I always get inspired by writing my novels yeah. because you, you think while you're writing that one, you get inspiration for the next one because other things will be crowding in your head and you go, well, that's she can't right. do that this time, but next time that's a cracker. So you just write it down, you know, because your head's full of all the things that could be happening, but it's a different story. So I always get inspired, although yeah. I will say, please, do I do not get inspired to murder anybody from my novels. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I get inspired when I make That's myself it. laugh. Yeah. <laughs> from yeah. my writing, it's so much fun. You know, it comes as a surprise yeah. and I'm like, oh, this is really funny. <laughs> I have done. Well, we, to... I... Oh, sorry, we're out of time. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Katrina. I'm less homesick when I'm writing oh, about Scotland. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Of course, that's probably true because you're you're there in your mind at least, right? Yeah, that's got to be absolutely. a very different experience. Yeah, right. we're getting lots of comments. This was a great session, oh, and good. I just uh, lots of many new titles to read. Thank you all. I think this has been absolutely fabulous. Um, I I really appreciate you participating. I've loved reading all of your books. I can highly recommend all of them. I had the best month of February and um, <laughs> reading everybody's books that I had in my writing. So I hope we've piqued your interest yes. to discover these global mysteries from this panel of very fine authors. And please stay tuned because the next panel that's coming up is Food for Thought, Culinary Mysteries at 11 o'clock. Um, and I think we might have like two minutes left. So if anybody has anything they want to say about their next book to come out, now's the time. We got like two minutes left. Well, my next book is coming out uh, next February, and it will be Alexa hiking the famous Milford track and getting into all sorts of trouble. Uh, okay. Culinary uh, Mysteries. My next book is called A Gingerbread House. So uh, obviously uh, everything's oh. going to go horribly wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> And Wendy? My next book is called Killer's Curse, 
and it's set in Dundee and New Orleans, and it will be out in April. And that's a detective oh. director, Shona McKenzie mystery. Somebody did ask a question, I'm sorry, just very briefly, saying, um, what, where is the best place to start my books? Because they haven't read them. You can start with Killer's Countdown, which is the first in the Detective Inspector Shona McKenzie Mysteries, and Antiques and Alibis, which is the first book in the Cass Claymore Humorous Mystery series. Okay. And how about and you, just, Arnie? Uh, well, uh, I've got a new Nora coming out, hopefully in May. It's called The Evening's Amethyst, which is a line from a Robert Louis Stevenson poem that has resonance to the girl who um, falls or is pushed uh, off a staircase at Exeter College in Oxford. And wow. Um, wow. my gal Nora gets involved. And that's actually a place that I studied at. So I know it well talking about going back to a place that you've been before. I still have my photos from my, my you know, studying there and they came in great stead. And uh -huh. again, I have friends over there. So, all right, oh, panel, wonderful. I think we have one. Yeah, very yeah. enjoyable. We're getting lots yeah. of good comments about that. Um, I hope people will please do us a, uh, a favor and look up some of the books from these amazing women and we'll <laughs> sign off now. Thank you so much. All right. ladies. Thanks Have everyone. A great rest of your day. Bye. 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 Bye.